Okay, well, just because it's in the news cycle, I thought we're kind of obliged the big, bigger stories to cover, at least for British politics. And uh, so there is the Tory leadership race. Obviously, after they did terribly at the last general election, uh, the leader is obliged to step down. They don't always, do they? But uh, when you really get a shellacking at a general election, the leader has to step aside. So old Rishi, brilliant leader that he was, leader of men that he was, moral leader. Inspiration. An inspiration. Uh, dominating the political scene for a generation, Rishi Sunak. Pocket PM. Has, has, to, has had to step down, and so there's been a leadership race. And now, finally, uh, it, it won't be completely finished until November, I believe. Uh, but we're now to the, down to the final two. And there was a... a I thought we'd, we'd better talk about it. Um, so, I mean, our position here at the Lotus Eaters was very much zero seats. We want to see the Tories completely annihilated, destroyed as a, a movement and an organisation. I still feel that way. I think everyone at Lotus Eaters does. So in one way, don't really care who becomes a leader. I hope, if anything, whoever it is, sinks them quicker and faster. Uh, but there's a couple of different angles you can take on this. So I thought we'll talk about it a bit. So the last four, I believe, was that Tugan Hat cretin, mm-hmm. James Cleverly, arch traitor James Cleverly, um, and then Kemi Badenoch, arch traitor Kemi Badenoch, and, um, and uh, Robert Jenrick who's also been in, in the party for a long time. So it looked like, in fact, I did a tweet which was within hours completely out of date. It looked like Cleverly was leading the pack. Well, he was leading the pack. And I said a tweet saying, oh, it looks like Cleverly's probably going to win this. And then in, when it was down to the last three, this is like 36 hours ago or so. And then yesterday, uh, there was a vote just among the parliamentary party, i.e. just among Tory MPs. And there's only, what, 120, 121? There's only, there's only 120 odd of them. So there's actually quite a small number. So five votes here or there can completely swing this, this thing. Um, so Tuggan Hat got booted out because he's a, he couldn't be more wet of a person. He's a nothing well, person. More loyal to Ukraine than he is to Britain. He also couldn't be less notable. Right, yeah. What what comes to mind when you think of Tom Tuggan Hat? Traitor. Other than, other than traitor... All of the all of the, the blank neg- blank all of the negative blank. Tory words we associate with the entire party. Wet. What comes to mind? Because I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who I only that? know of him because I do this job, right? Your average person will almost certainly not have heard of him. Your average American watching almost and, uh, certainly won't have heard of him. And they're better off for it. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. People would assume nothing, he was nothing. a children's character, <laughs> Tug and Hat. Yeah. He's a man without trousers, a man without a chest. He's a nothing. So anyway, but he got to the final four. Tells you what you need to know about the Tory party, doesn't it? And so it looked like Cleverly was leading the pack. But then, surprise, yesterday afternoon, uh, to whittle it down to the last two, Cleverly gets booted out because you know how it works. Once one person's booted out, it goes down to three. And so his 20 or 30 odd MPs that were voting for Tuggan Hat then split up amongst whoever. And the whole balance gets redrawn. And Cleverly lost. So where he was the front runner... Um, From an actual political perspective, I I do think, um, you know, if the Tories want any sort of hope of electoral victory in the future, Jenrick would be who you would go for. Mm -hmm. He's the only real candidate that I would think of who could bring some votes back to them. I was if not expecting. If you were pro Tory and wanted if, them to if, succeed if, in going forward. If you were pro Tory. Right. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah. And if you were an undecided moderate right. who sees the problems in the country and see that Jenrick's actually speaking about them, I can see that he would win people over. I was not expecting the Tories to go for him, though, if only because I imagine the sentiment. I got this wrong, but I would have imagined the sentiment within the Tory party would have been look, both of our candidates are black. Yeah, all right. You, yeah, I'm surprised they didn't. Yeah, there would have that. been the yeah. smugness coming yeah. from it. They would have been uh, trying to lord it over Labour. Look at how stale, pale, and male t- uh, Labour are, mm. and look at how diverse and forward thinking we Labor's are. Labour's very stale, pale, and female these days, isn't it? It's mm. Keir Starmer and his harem of incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so before we go on and talk about the various angles of it and how the, how the rest of it will play out, uh, we do have to, in the middle of the actual YouTube segment, uh, Shield the Islander, how, our magazine. Uh, because people will actually see it then. So buy, <laughs> buy this magazine. Uh, loads of work's gone into it. There's loads of uh, uh, great people that have written in it, like uh, Raw Egg Nationalist, Morgoth, AA, that Carl Benjamin fella, Dave Green, the distributor, Stefan Molyneux, and others, including that big Josh Firm off Lotus Eaters. And it's not uh, that. Uh, Look at you. What? Little man, you're also in there, aren't you, midget? Would you like me to put my seat up full? No. If anyone doesn't know what they're talking about, I'm a normal-sized human being. 
I'm like five nine, five oh, ten. These two size. guys are giants. <laughs> like, what are you six three and you're six five or something stupid? <laughs> no, Harry's I mean, actually eight foot tall. Yeah, no, he stands no, up. Calvin's six five. Mm. I'm six three. Josh is, you know, five eleven or something like that. I am not. <laughs> They're both well over six. Well, stupid. It's unfair. <laughs> You're hogging all the height. You're bogarting in the height. I stole it from you. So I come fair, in and yeah. I absorb the height of others around me. It's a zero sum sorted. game, and you've, <laughs> sold, you've stolen it from short men. If you leave food, um, Harry right. will eat it. He's like, um, a, he's like a cat. No, do, I'm actually but, very fussy. But, but Dubai Islander, because it's one of the, our revenue streams, despite what some people say, um, like Dave Morgan or Jada Franson or, or Nick Cotton, we're not funded by <laughs> either Tel Aviv nor. <laughs> Not on Moscow. It's all from or our, Tehran. Either. Or, or Tehran. It's all from our subscriber base and things like the Islander magazine and a little bit of merch and a few and a few uh, and a few uh, super chats. We Which get. is so why I live. It does in make a, a big difference. Yeah. Just please do buy it. That's why I live in a miserable flat in Swindon. Right. <laughs> he lives in an Indian hovel. I actually do. <laughs> please help me. <laughs> Spent a lot of our money on this on this video screen. It's, it's worth more than. I me, think we should be talking about the Tories. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 The Tories. Yeah. 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 Good save, good save, Harry. All right, so the Tories. Here's the BBC. So it's down to Badenoch and Jenrick, um, both of which I, I, I've got no love for, of course. They're both, they're both sort of crazy people, as far as I'm concerned, who haven't got our best interests at heart. Never have. They might pretend they do. Sometimes say words to that effect, but um, don't, don't trust them, don't believe them. So there's two main schools of thought. One, that uh, Kemi wins. And hopefully then at the ballot box, at the next general election, the Tories stay annihilated, if not lose more. So that's one angle. So if you want that, then you'd probably want her to win. You know, if you really were all in for complete Tory annihilation. So I think on the strength of it, I'm in two minds about what I would prefer. There's either that or the other one is Jenrick wins. And then he has some sort of based arms race with Nigel over who can be more based. Now... Maybe, maybe that. I wouldn't mind that either. If it does actually draw reform to the right, because despite my long and storied relationship with the right and how much shade I throw at them on Twitter, oh sorry, with reform, how much shade I throw at reform on Twitter, it's it, it's not about me. If they are any in any way, shape, or form drawn to the right and start talking about deportations and remigration, then I'm happy with that. I don't care what it takes to do that. This isn't about me and my vanity. It's about getting our country back. So if Jenrick is able to act as a vehicle to do that then great well then the question becomes do you trust either um, a generic led tory party or reform in that situation to actually uphold still their promises really. and not stab you in the back yeah, yeah no still not really i think yeah. farage in the stephen edgington interview where he says that it's politically impossible mm. i think that farage is very much married to his very liberal ideas and i think that he is um genuinely presenting his beliefs authentically there uh, it, just based on his political track record he's been pretty consistent on these sorts of things it's kind of difficult to walk that back that was one of the things that was surprising about that edgington farage interview was that nigel seemed to give himself no real uh, wiggle room did he mm. he, he said it three, two or three or even four times it's, it, it is impossible so, I mean, politicians can, of course, do 180s and go back on their what they've said previously and do often, but I don't feel like that's one of them. That's why I'm edging towards I would probably rather Kimmy win, Kemi, and uh, completely destroy, not Kimmy Raikkonen, Kemi, <laughs> uh, and so just destroy the toys because I don't think, even if Jenrick wins and he's saying all this based stuff about remigration and everything, I don't think that would move Nigel. still don't think Nigel would really move much. Yeah, in the I face agree. Of that. I, I, so if that is true, if that take, that guess of what the future holds is correct, then, then it's not worth it. I you think may as well go with Kemi then. There are likely factions within the Reform Party, the younger factions, who would want to pull the party and probably already do want to pull the party that way. Because, um, you know, of course, we know people who are in Reform themselves and they do want to pull the party that way. And they might be able to point towards Jenrick's rhetoric as a reason to shift rightwards. Yeah. yeah. Reform is sure. sort of a dictatorship of the boomers at the minute, isn't it? And they haven't really cottoned on to the nature of electoral politics at the minute and it's 
it, they're going to have to have a wake up call if they're going to remain relevant. So the thing is, that just as you say, exactly that. I mean, we had uh, that young Charlie Downs in, didn't we, just yesterday? Talking, yesterday, yes. Talking about it. So, yeah, that's absolutely true. That the, A lot of the youngers, a lot of I mean, Zoomers Charlie and want to go that Connor way. Charlie were specifically at the Reform Party conference yeah. and they were speaking about remigration and the need yeah. for lots and lots of people, illegal criminals, people who are in this country illegally in the first place, to be removed from the country. And supposedly what they were told me, and I think I saw the clip as well, they were in a room that were full of the younger reform members who all gave them a very big cheer for it. Yeah. And it was the older elements of the party that winced when he said it. And all that's well and good, and I will cheer them on, and I'm behind them, and I back them up in all their endeavours. The reality is, though, the party leadership, particularly the party leader, has basically got last say over policy. Nigel's a very stubborn person. Often, that's a good thing. Right? That's how he got the He was very stubborn Brexit. about Brexit, and that was great, right? I don't see... I, I, I hope it's not the case, but I don't really see him being swayed on something like mass remigration by even loud, many, many loud voices like those of, of Connor and Charlie. I hope he does. I say I, I'm behind them, 100%. I'm one of their cheerleaders on that. I don't see Nigel sort of folding under that kind of pressure. And that, that's the way it is with the party politics, is that the leadership, and particularly the leader, and particularly with reform, um, what the leader wants, that is what the policy will be. So you're actually genuinely changing Nigel's mind. That's, t that's hard. That would be hard. I feel like regardless of all the pressure from the likes of us, from the likes of the young reformers, from the likes of Jenrick, I don't think any of it will sway Nigel, really. He says it's impossible. And I think, as you said, he really believes that. Mm. He absolutely believes that. I think Nigel thinks that it would be electoral suicide to start talking about mass remigration. When I say things like this on Twitter, there's always a small 10% of people saying that. No, that would be, that would be insane. They'd lose the few MPs they've already got. They'd lose millions of votes if they started talking about that. I think the exact opposite. I think they would gain millions more votes if they started talking about it. But there you go. I think that's the calculation in Nigel's mind. Anyway, back to the Tory race. So, um, now it's down to two. It actually gets thrown open to the Tory party membership, which is tens of thousands of people. We're not sure exactly how many they are, because I think whenever the Tories themselves release how many members they've got, they always exaggerate the number. It's certainly in the tens of thousands. A few decades ago, it used to be a couple million, but nowadays it's probably something more like 50,000 or 90,000, something, uh, something in that ballpark. Something in that ballpark. The massive problem whereby they lost a lot of funding because they lost so many members recently. Mm -hmm. And it'd be interesting to see which sections of their membership had lost, because in the past, normally the, the, the conservative base, the members, would normally be on the right-hand side of the party, sometimes a lot further right than the actual parliamentary party. Mm. And so you would imagine that they'd probably go for generic. However, it's difficult to say, because I've not necessarily been looking into it in great detail, whether that um, disposition has remained with the Conservatives or whether they've jumped ship to reform or just left the party, which is entirely possible. It wouldn't be shocking if it's mainly the wets remaining as members. Mm. I, I would that's say so as well, yeah. I think that's the worry. Um, so the exact number isn't clear. I think they claim they've got 90 odd thousand members, something in that ballpark. But if you actually look at their company's house stuff, it can't be much more than 50,000. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. It's a few tens of thousands of Tory party members get to actually vote on the final two. And it is a real litmus test, isn't it? Do you want first generation Kemi Badenoch or do you want Jenrick who at least pretends to be a bit based? Now, uh, actually, Samson, can you go to the tab that is the YouGov tab? I think it's three further on from there. And on that page, if you scroll down a bit, there's some data and it looks like maybe Kemi is, you know, slightly edges it, oh. which would mean, if that is the case, if it turns out that that is true, or you scroll down a bit more, I think there's another one where it's a, it shows a bit closer, look, things like this. Um, well, then uh, it would be the wets that are left, the boomers that are terrified, not only terrified of being called a racist or anything like that, but they're dying to have a woman of colour lead them. Right. I mean, has, they, has there ever already... been a more worthless set of individuals than current Tory party members? I think uh, Father they Robinson. Already, like... uh, uh, I don't include him in that because I think they, he's still. They, they already like bragging member of about these now. things. Oh yeah, sorry, that's right. Yeah, he's a UKIP man now. Sorry, that's right. Uh, I was going to say the uh, can, the Tories already like bragging about these things. First Jewish prime minister with um, Disraeli. Right. First woman prime minister. Second woman prime minister. Third 
very, very temporary woman prime minister, and then also the first prime minister of colour with Rishi Sunak. And look how that turned out for them. Mm. So I would not be shocked if simply for the sake of social justice virtue Mm. signalling, they desperately, there's a massive portion of that party that desperately want first black woman. Mm. So that even skips over first black prime minister. That's one notch above in their estimations. Yeah, cleverly wasn't virtue signaling enough for them. Yeah, they need. They, they were looking at him and going, "Well, he's a bit pale, but Badenog, yeah, she's like Nigerian black." Plus, he's a male, which means toxic. So, not him, please. But if I had to put a tenor on it right now, I'd probably put it on Jenrick because I still feel like, and it can totally be proved wrong in November. I'll probably revisit it then. But I feel like the average Tory member still is sort of a little Englander, sort of semi, probably a rural person living in a village. And they may be sort of a, a, a boomer virtue signaler, but they'd probably, their gut still probably wants someone like Jenrick over Badenoch. But I don't know. I imagine I it'll think be all close. the data sh- says it's going to be close, right? Mm. Yeah, that's just what I was going to say. I think it'll be really close. Um, and I don't, personally, I don't really mind one way or another. Um, I suppose if I really had to say, I'd probably rather Kemi, because that is a, a, a truer path to annihilation for the party, for them. I think, I hope. Now, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Right. We were talking about this yesterday, weren't we? And I, I basically said exactly that, that I want to see the party destroyed. It doesn't matter if they rehabilitate themselves. They're too tainted with treachery to, to ever um, warrant any electoral success whatsoever, in my opinion. In, the, in Australia, I think it was, they had the, the, the Conservative Party that got, uh, got trounced a while ago now, 10 years ago old or something. And everyone said, oh, well, you know, that, that's a low ebb. But they'll come back. Obviously, they're an institution. They've sort of been around forever sort of thing. They'll surely come back at some point. And they haven't really. They haven't ever really recovered from that. I'm hoping that's what will happen here. So would we very, very quickly like to explain why it is that this podcast in particular has had such a complete 180 from a few years ago when Carl was cheerleading Kemi? Because I think we should just make it very, very clear to people who are who are watching, who might be a bit confused. Do you remember those well, years? is it simply that none of us agreed with Carl at the time? Was that? <laughs> well, yes, but still. Um, yeah, so Ke- Kemi back in the day, and I think she still does, uh, made a very, very strong front on the trans issues. Uh, but the trans issues now are a much lower order of priority in, compar- uh, in comparison to mass migration, which is the thing that will destroy this country if it's allowed to continue at the pace it is currently. And, and second of all, ah, you've got it. Um, yeah, Kem- Kemi is not an opponent of mass migration in the slightest and has in the past uh, made moves and actively supported measures to open up visa routes for people to get into this country, as we can see here. Yeah, well, let's play this little clip. The great Steve Edgington on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Give him a follow for sure. Oh. Thank you, oh. Mr. Speaker. Oh. As a first generation immigrant, can I welcome the Home Secretary statement, uh, which I, I feel this immigration white paper is a move from the 20th century to a uh, much better future immigration system. In particular, I'd like right to thank the Home history, Secretary guys. for removing the mm. annual limits on work visas and also on international students, both of which I lobbied for on behalf of the Welcome Sanger Institute and Anglia Ruskin University, which serve my constituency. Could he elaborate on how removing the work visa cap in particular... Uh, shut up, shut up. So, th- this, okay, is, so- this is the same perspective given by uh, that in- recent interview with Preeti Patel, where she was saying, when she was questioned about why is it that record numbers of people came in while you were Home Secretary, and she went, oh, well, the NHS needed it. Don't you want people to get the care that they need? Do you want to let old people starve? Is that what you want? Do you, do you want to let them die in the hospitals? That was essentially the sort of hand-wringing excuses that she was giving. I'd rather just lower the, the national levels of, of sex crime and street crime and organised crime. I'd rather that, actually. And fix the economy and make houses cheaper. Loads and, and yeah. loads, and loads of things. Roads easier to Nearly drive. all our social ills, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, one thing to say, just to finish up, on like, why Carl was, um, even not too long ago, and Connor and a few others sort of still saying, you know, we can take, before they were thrown out of the party themselves, <laughs> unceremoniously dumped from the party. We'd take them over from the inside and stuff, and a lot of us didn't agree at the time. Some people think, still, even I had this on Twitter from an old reform guy just the other day, saying that, like, Cole's like some sort of party leader who sets policy, and we all get in line with what he says. It's the furthest thing from the truth. Cole lets us completely have our own opinions. We disagree about, all of us disagree about all sorts of things constantly. I've, I've explained. And he's never ever told us this is the line, this is the lotus seated line that you must follow. Not at all. 
I've explained to people all. outside who are always really shocked because of how other businesses like ours or the media industry mm, uh, businesses right, yeah, operate. Yeah, yeah. We have a remarkable level of editorial freedom. Massive almost credit to completely. Carl. Yeah, so, yeah. so thank completely. Carl for that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Carl, yeah, yeah, it's great. There's a few red lines where we know we'll just get yeeted if someone says something like that, right? Beyond that, you're, we're free to say more or less exactly what we want and feel. Certainly Carl never tries to put words in our mouths, the furthest thing from it. Mm -hmm. So he's very enlightened as a boss in that way. Uh, got to give it to him, got to give it to him. So, okay, I think that's all I'm going to say on this. Um, let us know in the comments if you'd rather generic or bad or not, or whether you don't really care. I hope you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters. And if you want to see more of what we're up to, you can follow Dan's series, Brokenomics. Here he's talking about Tony Blair's new book on leadership. And if you want to see all the other work we're putting out, you can follow us on Twitter. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye. <laughs>